we realized we have a lot of clients that end up uh, downsizing. We have a lot of empty nesters, guys in the room that moved to the moved to Madison, and I want to be closer to family and grandkids. Um, those who just realize they have a little bit uh, more space than they need and want to start thinking through, like getting out of this bigger home um, and get into something that's a little bit more comfortable for their current um, state of life. So we thought it'd be a great opportunity to bring in some great resources here in the local area, just be able to help people um, get a better idea as to what that looks like, what downsizing looks like, um, what questions you should be asking yourself, um, and even just making sure you put all the ducks in a row. So um, should be able to get some valuable information here tonight. Um, be able to answer or ask some good questions and then also meet some friendly faces that will be able to help you guys if you have any more needs moving forward. Um, so first I want to introduce Katie. Katie can come up here. Katie's with uh, Renewal, uh, like Renewal All Gate. Thank you. Um, and she helps with organizing. Um, I will come into your home and help you determine what needs to stay, what needs to go, how to get rid of uh, things to trash, to save biddies and a few other things like that. Uh, like Matt said, um, my name is Katie Wagner. I'm a professional organizer. So I help people declutter, organize, and downsize um, their spaces and their belongings. And, um, <laughs> you know, focus on downsizing here when you have like a major like transition. So we'll talk a little bit about how to set some goals or intentions for your downsizing journey or projects. And then we'll um, share some criteria on how to decide what items stay and what items go. And then I'll share some tips on like how to get started so the project isn't quite so daunting and overwhelming. So um, I'm guessing a lot of you are here because you or like a loved one is going through uh, maybe a new phase of your life retirement or getting close thinking about retirement or maybe you moved to be closer to family. Um, maybe you just want a home that's easier and maintain um, less responsibility, uh, fewer bathrooms to clean, I don't know, right? Just to make things more simple. Uh, or it could be a medical necessity too. So whatever the reason is, um, it's kind of a great opportunity to reflect on why we're why we're going through this downsizing journey, what our goals are, um, like what do we hope to achieve, like what do we hope to be and do um, in that next phase. So I'm going to kind of ask you some questions that you can ask yourself. And um, I did create just some like note pages. So before you leave today, if you want to just grab one of these little sheets of paper there um, on the snack table over there, but it will just be a nice space for you to like think through um, some of your goals. So here's some exploratory questions to help you reach, like, what is my objective? What am I, what am I hoping for? Um, so why are you downsizing? Again, I touched on some of those um, options. Yeah, thanks. Um, what is your vision for your new home? Like, how do you want it to feel when you walk into your new home? Maybe you want it to be um, very um, clean lines and not much furniture, and open spaces, or maybe you want it to be like cozy where you can read a book and have friends over by the fire. Um, so like think about like how you want it to feel because the items you bring with you are gonna help determine the feel. And then um, what opportunities do you want to enjoy in this next phase? So opportunities could be things you want to do outside of your home that help you with your home purchase. Maybe um, you want to travel a lot, and having something smaller would make it easier to do that. Like not to have a lawn to mow or um, you know, snow to shovel, that sort of thing. And then another question to think about are, you know, what challenges may keep you from making the most of these opportunities? So again, just some questions to think about. And my hope is that by asking these questions, you can set some goals and you can use those goals as like a lens. So while you're going through your downsizing process, you can kind of say, oh yeah, like my hope is really to live a more simple life or I want to be outside more. And if I bring all of this stuff with me, like it's going to be harder for me to achieve that goal, right? So writing some goals down um, helps you have a reference point. Um, all right, so next, some criteria for what stays or what goes. So you're going to be reviewing your belongings and choosing with intention what items are like most important to you. And I like to say like what items 
earned their keep, right? So they earned their keep in your in your new home, the whole process it took to get there, right? Like you had to keep them, you had to pack them into a box, they moved, you had to unpack them and find a new home for them. I mean, that's some pretty important stuff that you're devoting the time and energy to do that. So these items that you're taking with you are like the best of the best. They've earned their keep, they're important to you, and they fulfill that dream that you set. Uh, of course, I realize that you may have uh, decades and decades of stuff in your home. Um, maybe you've perhaps lived there for a while, or things have just found their way um, to your home. So it's not always going to be easy. You, you have memories, you have keepsakes, you've got yard tools and kitchen gadgets, like a ton of stuff. So there's going to be a lot to you, and it helps to have um, some questions. So these are some good thoughts, some good questions to ask when you're trying to decide, do I take it to my next home or do I pass it on? Um, I mean, it's just in the handout, so it's a nice reference for you. Um, is it important to me? Do I love it? Do I treasure it? Does it increase the quality of my life? Uh, here's a good one. When I've had an opportunity to use it or wear it, have I? You know, some of those dresses or shoes um, in the closet maybe. Um, okay, is it hard to replace if I need it again? So sometimes we have fear of like letting go of things. Um, and of course, we don't want to be always buying the same things over again. But at some point, it's like, you know, I probably am not going to need this. I'm going to let it go. And worst case scenario, if I have to buy it again, like, you know, right, is that, that kind of thing is what we're talking about. Um, do I need to need it for tax or legal purposes? Does it fit reasonably and comfortably into the space I have? Right? So you might be downsizing into a smaller home or just a place with fewer closets, or maybe you don't have a basement, right? Like you really gotta think about, does it even fit and fit comfortably into the space I have? Um, will I have more space to do the things I want if I give it away? And then lastly, again, does it fit into my dream for my next home? So those are some good questions that you know, maybe you can circle some that resonate with you that you can use to decide if an item should stay or, or should go. And um, I guess I'm here to say also that your stuff doesn't define who you are, right? Like it's just, it's just stuff. It's not you. Um, and letting go of some of that stuff, you might find yourself letting go of some um, like weight or burden might find that you feel uh, a little more calm and stress-free by having less. Um, it can open you up to more possibilities. So um, maybe look at it as an opportunity and not so much about losing something, right? When you're letting go of your things. You're not you're always losing something. You are saying yes to something, to something else. So try to look at it in a more positive spirit and be a little more optimistic about this whole downsizing process. Um, okay, so we are going to be making decisions about what to keep and what to let go, and I realize that is a really hard part about downsizing. So again, um, those questions that I just went through are kind of a good, a good checkbox to say, do I really need it to move or is it time to let it go? Um, okay, so I'm going to talk through some types of clutter that you're likely to encounter during this process. And some say clutter is really stuff that's just like getting in the way of who we want to be. Um, on the kitchen counter, getting in our way for making a nice deal, you know, dinner or a nice meal or you know, stuff on the table by the TV that are making it hard for me to just relax and I get on the floor, you know, clutter. You might find something called memory clutter. So memory clutter reminds you of a person an achievement or some event of the past. That's what memory clutter is, something um, from the past. And um, my challenge to you is that is great and lovely and I want you to find the treasure in it. So um, let me walk you through the scenario and maybe 
think of something similar in your life. Uh, so let's say you loved going fishing with your grandpa when you were a kid. It's this beautiful memory that you have of your grandpa. And therefore, you have somehow inherited like three tackle boxes, five fishing poles, a couple of fishing trophies, and you know, maybe even some taxidermy fish on the wall, all from your grandpa. And it's in your basement in boxes. Um, so the question to you is like, is it really being treasured in the boxes in the basement? Um, is there perhaps a more meaningful way you could take those items? So what if you went through all those items and you thought, you know what, I really like this one reel and like these three lures and oh, there's a really cute picture of me and grandpa by the stream. And instead you could create like a really cute shadow box with those items. And that is your, that is a way for you to look and remember and look she with your grandpa. And then you could let the rest of it go, right? Like keeping everything kind of means like nothing is important, right? If I keep all of that fishing stuff from grandpa or whatever, it might be, um, it's not really saying any of that's important because there's so much of it. So don't keep every item, choose like the best of the best. Hopefully that was a good example, but it could be anything. It could be like the China. From your, you know, from your um, ancestors. Well, maybe just pick, pick like one piece and display it um, instead of feeling like you have to keep the entire set of, of china, right? So determine what those items are that you consider treasures, and just keep one or two, you know, a small amount of them, and display it in some way. So some other ideas I have is you could um, set a cute scene with the items photo of it and frame the photo. Um, maybe you have like beautiful tea kettles. You could take a picture of all the beautiful tea kettles and make a photo book um, and maybe let some of those tea kettles go. Uh, the dining room table strategy. All right, so let's say you're going through your items and what I would like you to do is clear up your dining room table and that is going to be like a, a space constraint. So if you're having like a really hard time making decisions, I'm gonna say you only can keep what fits on the dining room table. So going through your boxes, whether it be stuff in the basement or memorabilia or, or even just shoes, whatever it might be, like set, give yourself some parameters that you can only bring with you what fits on the dining room table. Um, and that will help you at least do some choosing and selective processing about Oh, another tip about a memory. So let's go back to the fishing example, right? While you've taken this time to choose like what's most important to you, these select fishing items from grandpa, go ahead and write a little note. You know, maybe share an experience about fishing with your grandpa. I was so meaningful and, you know, three great things I loved about my grandpa and put it, uh, you know, Tape that piece of paper to the back of the item and that's going to help like generations and generations understand like why that item was important to you and the story of it in your family and you know someday when when kids are going through their stuff they're going to know like this is really important to my mom or dad i'm going to keep it um, because you left that in all right so that was kind of a quick discussion about memory clutter how about the I might need it someday clutter? Anybody have I might need it someday clutter? I mean, two years ago it was like, I might need all these canned goods because they're gonna run out and the pantry's overflowing of like the beans, you know? There was that, which I mean, maybe we still have so, the pantry. Anyway, um, the problem is when you have so much stuff that you're worrying about, I just might need it, that it's like, taking over you comfortably living in your home or your space. Um, you don't want to take all of that with you, right? So um, again, only bring things that reasonably and comfortably fit into your new home. So you, you're going to know more or less what size kitchen pantry you have, and what's a reasonable amount of food to take with you or kitchen appliances to take with you, uh, serving items for a big party, right? So things that fit, uh, things that you regularly use now. So maybe you bought this beautiful punch bowl and set to entertain a big party. You're keeping it because you just 
you just might need it someday. You must just might throw that big party. Well, if you haven't, kind of guess that you may not in the future and that it's probably okay to just let it go and not feel guilty about it. Um, and let's see, if you do have something that you want to give, you know, give to somebody else, I would say that's fine to keep as long as you have like, a date in the very near future that you're going to pass that item on and it can fit your home. If you're saving something for somebody for like five years from now, you know, it's hard to say that it's going to be needed or used or allowed by that person. All right. And then um, the last type of clutter is called malignant clutter. Malignant. So this is like, it leaves you with like a bad negative feeling. Why would you want to take anything to your new home that makes you feel like icky, right? So um, it's kind of time to shed those items that you don't feel good about or don't make you feel good about yourself. So um, an example is maybe I overspent. Like, what if I bought this beautiful designer handbag that was like three times what I normally would buy and I never use it? I don't know, maybe it's just isn't the right style or the right size. And every time I go in my closet and I see it, I just feel like this guilt. Like, oh my gosh, I spent so much on the bizarre handbag, you know, and you're just keeping it. Um, just like, let that go. It's okay, just let it go. Um, you don't want to feel guilty about the things you're bringing into your home. So that goes for like clothes that don't fit. That goes for gifts people gave you that are just not really your style. And you're just like, it's okay to let it go or um, a new hobby you thought you would do and you never did, like just let it go, right? Don't take it with you and you feel so guilty about how you never took up sewing even though you bought a sewing machine. Like, oh well, we all, we all do it. You know, somebody else can use that, use that item. So don't allow fear and guilt to get it. All right, so um, how to get started. I would really encourage you to start early and just start small. Um, it's best to start when you don't need to start because when you have to start downsizing usually um, it can be a little traumatic you're trying to do this huge project all at one time so start early I suggest starting small so maybe even just plan on doing it like 20 minutes a day pick really simple spots that you can tackle or maybe you're gonna spend an hour on a Saturday morning to work on it and over time, you can maybe increase that a little bit if you start to get in the groove and build up your muscle and you're feeling good about it. Um, but don't plan to like, oh, all weekend, we're gonna we're gonna tackle the stuff in the basement. I don't know, don't do that first. That's not gonna go well, right? Um, pick like a couple kitchen drawers that are easy or maybe the linen closet or your bathroom vanity, like things that could be easy wins. Pick those first and just work for a short period of time and call it good and you know and move on so go ahead and start start early work in short periods of time and go ahead and like schedule that on your calendar so that you can be intentional about when you're going to tackle the project and time just doesn't pass by um, i will also recommend to leave things like photos and scrapbooks and letters for the end that stuff is really time consuming um don't start there again start with some easy um, also, you want to have some supplies ready. So things are either going to be keep, they're going to go in the garbage, you are going to recycle them, um, donate them, and there'll be maybe some select items that are worth, worth selling. I would say really if it's only worth the time and effort you're going to spend and the money that you're going to get for it, is it, is it probably worth to sell? So have different boxes or bins ready to go and kind of have a plan. When you get to the end of your project and you're tackling bigger areas, you might decide you need like a really small dumpster for a day, you know, or you might need to arrange for a big drop off at clean sweep for a bunch of recycling. So kind of think of those things as you work through your project, especially as you get into like the garage or the basement. Um, so I guess I'll just finish by seeing if anybody has any questions and then I'll chat a little bit about how I can help if you decide that you still don't want to tackle this on your own or you just want someone um, kind of to coach you along it, I can share my experience as well. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you're looking for someone just to like give you a head start or even to work throughout the entire project for you, that's that's what I do. So I work with people and families to help evaluate their items, 
Um, if you're at a stage where you are like ready to list your home or you are moving, um, even to like start packing some of that stuff for you. Um, and then I even help uh, manage part of the move and then unpack. I help people unpack and get settled so that they can you know, be home and feel at home right away. Um, and then I organize spaces in general. So if you've been in your home for a day or you know 10 years plus um, help, I guess, manage the clutter and the chaos and make your home feel like a nice, comfortable, relaxing place. Well, thanks, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll have some questions, uh, time for questions afterwards too. So if you think of a question for Katie, um, we'll have a chance to ask her some later. But some really great practical tips. So hopefully you guys wrote down some stuff. Even just the questions, those are questions I have to ask myself as I go through my closet whether or not I should keep certain things or not. So thanks for that resource of just the, the, um, uh, the questions that go through. Um, Kate's also been a huge resource for some of our clients who have uh, downsized and had to have hands-on help with determining what to keep, um, packing, organizing, moving. Um, so she's been a lifesaver for some of our clients in recent times too. So feel free to reach out to her if you'd like her to come by and help you with anything you might need there that way. Uh, next up, I want to have Eric Christopherson come up. Eric owns and operates um, um, uh, Grants and Christopherson. They are an estate uh, attorney firm here in town. Um, they actually now have five offices here in the general area. Um, their main one, their, their, their primary one started in Middleton um, and then now has uh, locations in Wanakee, Oregon, Verona, um, and Stoughton to go on with their one here in, in Middleton. So um, Eric can help um, get an idea as to how to put your um, ducks in a row for all the bigger decisions that you're going to have to make and make your family members will have to consider um, as uh, you consider downsizing in, in that next stage of life. So Eric, please uh, have a stage. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. Really appreciate being here. Yeah, lots of good stuff from, from you, Katie. I took some notes myself here. So, um, uh, Well, first off, I see a few couples in the crowd. So I just want to share a story about a couple. So a couple was working hard, decluttering, downsizing their home. And, you know, it's getting towards the end of the day and the wife gets tired and she says, you know what? I'm done for the day. I'm going to go pour myself a nice big glass of wine and go sit on the back porch for a little while. So the husband's like, no, I'm going to keep working for a little bit. So he goes out there in a little bit, sees the wife watching the sunset, drinking her almost empty big glass of wine at this point. And he hears her say, I love you so much. I don't know what I would ever do without you. And so he uh, jokingly says to her, he goes, was that you talking or is that the wine? And she says, that's me talking to the wine. <laughs> so uh, just uh, wanted to start off with a little humor and uh, keep it light. But um, a couple of things I wanted to also start off just tying into some of the things that uh, Katie said that I thought were really great, just as it pertains to um, personal property, you know, tangible items, the stuff you own and the legalities surrounding that. So um, one of the things obviously that I always get asked a lot of is one of the questions she had on the outline is, do I need it for tax or legal purposes? And so, well, I'm a lawyer, I get, that, I get asked that a lot. And so the one thing we tell people that I'd see is probably the biggest culprit that people do is um, paper financial statements. In this day and age, you know, if you like to retain paper financial statements, that's fine, but really there's no need for it because the other question that she asked is, you know, is it easy to replace? And the answer now is yes, because you can call your financial advisor and if you needed a certain set of financial records, they'll be able to regenerate for you because all that stuff is computerized now. If you do keep that kind of stuff, I tell people, you know, three years is good. Don't, you don't need your whole life history of your um, investments. So um, tax returns is another uh, situation. We tell people keep a little longer, usually seven years for tax returns. Um, and then the one thing you will want to keep, you know, essentially forever is your estate planning documents, your will and your trust and your powers of attorney. And then obviously your kids will be responsible for um, taking care of that uh, after you're gone. So, um, so those are some of, I think, just the key, key small things uh, in that area. The other thing I, I sometimes get asked a lot is, well, what, you know, what happens with my items that I don't give away, that I don't downsize, you know, these important things that I keep for myself as part of my estate. 
And so how we handle that at my law firm is whether you have a will or whether you have a trust, we always have a method called a property memorandum. And a property memorandum is really just a list that you are able to make for yourself. And then your will or your trust will say, I might make a property memorandum. If I do, you should follow that property memorandum. And it's in a way that we allow clients to really take charge of that aspect of their estate, not have it be tied in with their will or their trust where you've got to go in and see your attorney just because you decided, oh, I want to leave this different piece of jewelry to this different granddaughter, or whatever the case might be. You know, you're basically able to completely self-maintain your distribution of tangible items. So that's, we find that to be a, a very efficient thing. And the other thing I would say to suggest in that regard too, is when you are downsizing and thinking about what's important, you know, heirloom wise, and what do I want to pass on to the next generation? I encourage my clients as much as they can to actually pass on some of that stuff right then and there while they're downsizing, rather than doing it after they're gone. Um, the reasons being a, a fewfold, you know, number one is that if you pass it down to that loved one when you're downsizing, you can actually personally share with them the memory. Again, a lot of times, probably even sometimes valuable items or meaningful items, they're meaningful because they have a specific memory tied to it. And then that's the opportunity for you to share that memory. Whereas once you're gone, sometimes your family doesn't know why was this particular thing important. And then if they don't know, then if it's not important to them, they don't know why it was important to you. And then all the effort that you made to save and maintain it, you know, might be for naught. So um, you get to share that special memory. And then also, you know, in terms of analyzing, well, what do I give to people now versus what do I keep? I always say, well, is, is this special memory heirloom item, is it gonna be something that you personally are using or are you just really holding on to it to pass on to them so that they can hold on to it and pass it down to their kid, you know? And if it's that type of thing, you know, again, if it's not going to be used or enjoyed in your life now, go ahead and pass on that memory while you're alive and share that, um, share that memory with the loved one. And that way, um, it's a win-win because you get it decluttered and you get to share that special memory. So that's, um, I think what I wanted to say mostly about uh, the tangible items uh, aspect of, of things. Um, so um, where we see this happen a lot, and you know, again, to echo what, um, what Katie said about starting early, um, that's another big important thing because when we usually see this downsizing process forced is we'll see a client moving either from their house into a condo or their house into an assisted living or maybe they had a house and a cabin and they decided we're going to sell the house and just move up to the cabin and that will become our full property. Um, so in any of these examples, what you're seeing is you're going from two houses to one, or you're going from one house to zero, or you're going from a house to a condo with much less square footage. Any of these scenarios, you're automatically forced downsizing because of the size of your new living arrangement. And so that's not a great time to downsize as, as Katie's saying, you want to already be working towards that ahead of time. So um, just in terms of thinking about what is my next destination? I think that is going to be very helpful um, when you're when you're making that downsizing decision is kind of figure out what am I downsizing into? <laughs> because maybe even you do have stuff that's meaningful, but at that point you say, hey, I'm I'm having I have this meaningful stuff, but I'm going down from 3,000 square feet to 1,500, so I got to lose half my stuff regardless. <laughs> and so um, it's one of those things that you know kind of think about and. Um, plan your downsizing around where your next living arrangement is going to be. Um, and then the, the, the next uh, final segment that I want to talk to you about in terms of downsizing is um, downsizing, decluttering, um, you know, and I'm using these words kind of uh, figuratively, organizing, downsizing, decluttering your estate plan. So when we say your estate plan, what we mean is your will and trust, but also, you know, your other documents like powers of attorney, and healthcare power of attorney, all those important documents that lay out what your legal wishes are, who should make decisions for you, what types of decisions would you like them to make. A lot of times we see clutter in those types of documents where um, one common thing we see a lot of time is even for people who are retirement ages, they still have the will that they had when their kids were little. And it talks about who's gonna be the guardian for their kids and setting up a trust for their kids. And they're like, well, my kids are, 
40 years old. Why do I still have this? But, um, you know, they never updated and got their plan up to modern times. And then you'll look at their power of attorney for healthcare, their power of attorney for finance, and they'll still have their brother or sister in there. And they're like, well, I don't want my brother or sister doing that at this point. I want my kids doing that for me. And it's like, okay, well, that's good. You know, we know what you want, but now we have to actually declutter, get the siblings out of there, put the kids in there and get it, you know, fixed up and um, matching up what, what your current wishes are. So that's uh, another big one we see. And then as part of that whole process of just, you know, figuring out and analyzing what your wishes are, um, we, we usually are gonna look at three big things when you are at this, you know, retirement age, pre-retirement, you know, as you're looking at, you know, what is the next, phase of my life going to look like. And so in terms of uh, one of those things I did just mention is that, you know, making sure that all your advanced directives are in place, because a lot of times, you know, you want to be prepared for accident, injury, or illness, if there is a healthcare event, and just make sure that everyone's clear on, look, if there's an emergency, here's who's in charge of it, here's who's making the decision, this is what my wishes are, and having that all legally laid out. And like I said, especially laying out who are the proper people, making sure that your kids do have that legal authority if they're the ones that you're wanting to make that decision for you at that point in time. Um, So that's one thing is just making sure all those emergency advanced directives are in place. I can't tell you how sad it is when I have to help a parent, or excuse me, help a spouse either get guardianship of their own spouse or help children get guardianship of their parents simply because they didn't do some basic power of attorney documents. And that's what some people don't realize is, okay, well, I've, I failed to have the proper documents or name the proper people. And you literally end up, you know, taking a family to the court and asking the court to give you legal authority to make their decisions when that loved one could have just made that decision on a simple legal form ahead of time with no court involvement whatsoever. So that's one of the big things, just make sure you have your directives in place. And that's, that's for everyone. That's regardless of your estate size, what, whatever you have complex or not complex going on with finances. Um, everyone needs to have those those advanced directives current and in place. Um, as it pertains to the finances, then uh, one of the things we do strongly encourage is avoiding probate. So again, just like we talk about avoiding guardianship court, um, if we have an event of incapacity, we want to have our kids or our loved ones, whoever is managing our estate, be able to avoid the court when we pass away. You know, everyone will say, "I want it to be simple and easy for my family," but you know, again, in order to do that you have to take on a little extra work now, just like decluttering, you know, just like your family doesn't want to inherit all your clutter and have to declutter themselves. You know, if you can set up your finances in a smooth and efficient way, it can make it a lot easier for your loved ones after they're gone, after you're gone. And, um, you know, that's typically going to involve either setting up a trust or making sure that all your beneficiaries are properly, properly named and making sure that your whole estate is mapped out as far as who should receive what and when and under what conditions. And you know, making sure that that ideally can all be done privately within the family without getting a court involved. Because again, when you get a court involved, that leads to higher expenses. It also can lead to stress and frustration and infighting and all those different things that um, all families want to avoid. So, so that's the other big thing as you're as you're looking at your finances. Make sure that you're meeting with someone that can help advise you on you know what is probate and how could I avoid it in my particular situation and what what might I need to do. Um, Then the very last thing, again, this might be a a little older people, but on the horizon for some people is, you know, long-term care. And, you know, is is my downsizing um, happening because of, or could happen ultimately because of a long-term care event? Well, what is my plan, you know, in terms of my estate and my finances? Do I have a plan to protect my estate from long-term care costs? And there are things that can be done. Um, And so that's something that we do talk about with anyone in this age group is just, okay, You may be well and healthy now, but that's actually a great time to plan for the future for, well, what if I was no longer well and healthy? How would that affect my spouse? How would that affect my kids? How would that affect my finances? And what does that big picture look like um, for my estate plan? So that's another um, big goal or big factor that we factor in. Obviously, I I don't want to go too in-depth into all the different strategies you can do, but, you know, again, the point is, make sure that you're having the conversation with an attorney or with a qualified professional to say, these are my concerns. Let's talk about what I'm doing currently to address those concerns. And what else should I be doing to address those concerns? Whether the concerns is avoiding probate, whether it's long-term care, whether it's just making sure I have a good, clean plan 
that makes it clear who's in charge of my estate and where it's supposed to go. You know, all of those things should be um, addressed and talked about really on an individual basis in a confidential setting where you can um, share share your personal situation and find out um, find out what you need to be doing. So, and that's what I help people with. So, um, as as Matt said, I, I do I do that every day. I love what I do, and um, we help people all over the county. We one of our uh, key things that we like is that we do have you know five local offices so we're always meeting people in their local community wherever that may be and like i said just sitting down and having that no obligation no cost to you initial consultation where we just sit down and say hey tell me about your family and where things are at in life for you and what's important to you and from that you know kind of figure out well, what are some legal things that you could or should be doing and then you know you get to decide if that's something you want to um, implement or not so so yeah that's uh that's what i have to say uh, any uh any questions yes sir um under under what circumstances or, or when is it appropriate to have both a will and a trust versus maybe just a will yeah great question so um if you do have a trust you still always have a will yeah so um when you have a trust what your will says is i leave everything i have to my trust or I will it to my trust. So then in that type of plan, the will is more of just a placeholder and the trust does the heavy lifting versus under a standard plan, the will does the heavy lifting and distributes directly to the beneficiaries. So, um, so that's kind of that question. Then maybe part two to that is how do I know if I should have a trust versus should I have a will, you know, in terms of which one of those do I want to do the heavy lifting? Um, I would say that the you know one factor is the size and complexity of your estate you know so if we have clients for example who do own a cabin and a home you know or they do own a business or they have you know additional assets you know they have a lot of investments any of those factors maybe ones where you say hey because of those extra assets you have maybe you would benefit from gathering those assets together and placing them into a trust um, some people they'll do just fine with having a will and with naming, you know, beneficiaries on their assets and so forth. So um, it's not a um, bright line where you say this person needs a trust and this person doesn't. Because the other thing that also will factor into that decision for most people, um, in my experience, is um, if they have grandkids, you know, do they want to have their grandkids involved in their estate in any way? Because um, kind of. Going back to that idea of okay, when we were when we were younger, we had a trust set up for our children for when they were minors. Okay, well the concept there is if you want to have your grandchildren involved, you're actually now jumped to that next generation, and the same planning that you were doing for your kids in terms of setting up a trust for them and making sure they could inherit at the proper ages for them, you now have to do that for your grandkids if you want to have them be involved. So anyone who likes the idea of doing this. Um, what we call multi-generational planning or legacy planning, where you actually bring your grandchildren into the estate plan, that's another time where we have to use a trust um, because you know a will is not gonna be a good device to distribute to those uh, young grandchildren beneficiaries. And then anytime there's concerns about uh, a beneficiary who may have special needs or beneficiaries who may just not be as responsible with money and you think they could probably use further assistance with helping them manage it. You know, other factors um, could necessitate a trust based on the circumstances of the beneficiaries as well. So uh, definitely it's a good thing to um, have an individual consultation about, but I kind of just told you what, what factors we would consider, but you know, it's, it's really almost, you have to sit down and learn, learn about the whole family tree. And that's, that's what I love doing is you get to sit down and talk to people about their kids, their grandkids, what they've got going on in life as far as you know, property and you know, what's important to them. And yeah, that it's, it's really a uh, holistic conversation of lear learning about everything and figuring out from there. If someone doesn't take the effort to do that, you know, they're probably just trying to sell you on something as opposed to provide you with good advice and um, fiduciary analysis is, you know, is my opinion on that. So, but that's a very good question to get that one. Um, where is the best place to store your estate plan? Yeah. Great question. Um, and to tie into that, I'll give an example of how we handle our estate documents in a typical situation. So uh, once you work with us, you're going to actually get back your documents from us three different ways. 
Um, so you're going to get from us your actual original ink sign documents. So those are the ones that I say, the best place to store those is actually like a fire safe or safe deposit box. You're not actually ever gonna use or access those. It's purely an archival copy. Um, so that's for your actual ink original documents you sign. Now what we do for our other clients, for our clients as well is we make a copy of all of those documents and we assemble it into a really nice physical binder for you so that you have a table of contents that says, these are all the documents I have in here. And you have, you know, one through 10 with tabs. So you can flip to each one of those individual documents. We tell people that's your personal use copy. You just keep that at your desk or on a bookshelf or somewhere where it's going to be easy to access and um, be able to reference because if you're actually going to um, see and read and look up a document or say, oh, I need a copy of my healthcare power of attorney, or I need a copy of my financial power of attorney, or well, how, how did I leave my trust? Where was I leaving the assets to? You know, you'd be able to access that and flip to it. So that's your personal use copy. And then thirdly, the last thing we do now in this day and age is we do provide a USB drive that has an electronic copy of all those documents on it. Because when we talk about where do we store things now, electronically is sometimes a great uh, place to store things, especially for when you want your kids to have access to this and instead of them saying, oh, well, where's my safe or where's my binder? You just say, well, here's an electronic file and you know, you can put that on the cloud or you can give it to them so they can put it in their you know, cloud account. And that way everyone, when they need access to it, you just pull it up on the computer. So um, we're, we're, that's how we store our documents in my firm now is we've gone to you know, full electronic storage. And so that's, um, your law firm obviously will be another source of, of accessing those documents. So one of those questions of, is it hard to replace? Well, no, you know, if you need the documents, you just come to us. And we routinely provide copies of clients, their own documents that have been lost in the clutter. <laughs> so. Uh. If you think you're going to be moving to a different state when you retire, uh, how would you suggest if you don't have some of these documents, you know, because each state has their own set of laws and you're spending X number of dollars, and then if you have to move, then you have to spend more money to get it in line at your new state. Well, what are your thoughts and recommendations about that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think in your question, you gave a accurate description of the situation about how that would work. And so one of the things we talk with clients about is the portability of your estate plan, meaning, you know, is this a plan that you can take with you to a different jurisdiction? And so that's one of the times where trust actually, you know, highly wins out because wills are all going to be state, state law based. And your will has, to, if it goes to probate, gets probated in the county of your residence. And so again, if you're moving to Florida and you have a Wisconsin will, it's not gonna be great to have that admitted to a Florida court to interpret. But um, the nice thing with living trusts is they're accepted in all 50 states in terms of validity. You can create a state under, you can create a trust under any state's law. It can own property in any state. So I have many clients who have a Wisconsin trust, but that trust owns property in Florida or Arizona or other states. And that's perfectly fine because the nice thing with that is your trust is not going to be subject to a probate court jurisdiction when you die it's going to be privately administered by your family so no one's going to say oh well that's a wisconsin trust but your real estate is in florida you know it doesn't matter because that's done privately by your family and there's not a court process involved so um so that's where wills versus trust the trust does have a much higher advantage of portability um, and then the one thing you will want to consider still, I always say meeting with a local attorney on is your advanced directives, meaning your healthcare and financial power of attorney. I believe strongly that those are good to have locally. Um, and so this is always a confusing area when you have, we have many people who are, you know, basically 50, 50, where you live half, regardless of what your legal residency is, you basically live half of the year in one place and half the year in another place. And, you know, there's no right answer to this, but we've told some of them, we'll have your Florida directives for when you're down in Florida and have those with, with your Florida uh, health system. And if you seek healthcare up in Wisconsin, have Wisconsin directives for them because there's, um, there's no good, um, some of the law, some of the laws being that it's all, as you said, it's all state by state. It hasn't caught up to this day and age, how, how portable people are. <laughs> um, and I think that's, that issue is even going to become more and more uh, apparent. And yeah, there's 
very little of estate planning is federal federally related. It's almost all state by state. You know, the only thing that's really federal that we deal with is state taxes. And those are so, um, there's such a high exemption right now that um, we very rarely deal with that. So, um, so it's, yeah, that, that's an interesting problem and one that, you know, you'd, you'd certainly be best suited to discuss what your plans and timeframes are with your attorney and definitely assess um, cost versus benefit of buying into a plan if you think that the plan is not going to have a long shelf life based on your projected living situation. Um, that might mean buying into a more expensive plan that's portable, but you know, then you're not wasting, you know, I, I paid for a entry level plan here. I paid for an entry level plan in Florida. And at the end of the day, I spent more money and all I have is an entry level plan. So. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good to be here. So some of that might sound a little complicated. Uh, Eric and his team will do a great job breaking it down. And you don't need to have a huge estate to work with Eric and his team either. So um, they work with uh, the little guys as well as uh, the big guys as well. So if, regardless of where you are and, and where your state is, uh, feel comfortable reaching out to Eric and his team and they'll break it down, make sure you're comfortable with what, uh, what, they're, what they're suggesting. And then also they're happy to work with uh, wherever your state might be. So, um, well, I just want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Thanks for uh, just spending the evening with us. I uh, appreciate your support, your continued support for uh, myself and our real estate team. If there are any real, uh, real estate needs that you guys have or questions, please reach out. Uh, please continue to come to our events. We love doing these, whether it's these Live Well series, whether it's uh, Pie Giveaway or our Fall Family Day, which is coming up um, later this fall. We'd love to have you come out. Uh, otherwise, feel free to hang out for a little bit, and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you guys sometime soon. Thanks for coming out. Thank you. Thank you.